Anyway, perfect. <coughs> no doubt all that will appear in a bit. <coughs> Pardon me. Here's what I'm going to say, or at least attempt to say. So, um, there you are. Um, there's several things I'm not going to talk about, because there are other excellent talks about them. So let me recommend those to you. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, main loop and idle handling. Um, I don't know if the lights go... No, I don't need to go down much today. So VCL had, and uh, still has, basically a single timer at the back end. And this um, is, is quite interesting. Uh, there's, there's a main loop which has sort of all of the incoming I.O. So, uh, you know, window manager messages, uh, events posted uh, to, to the operating system, um, keystrokes, and this sort of thing comes in. And then there's one timer. And this timer is then used, and we build a main loop abstraction on top of that, and we set that timer to the shortest duration of all of the timers that we have. And we wait for the timeout and then emit uh, stuff and we start again. And this is how it's uh, worked for, you know, uh, <clears throat> for a long time. But what this meant was that in order to order events, when you want to get some kind of ordering, you know, this should happen first and then that should happen later, we just picked random numbers, okay? Now it's fine to pick random numbers, but these random numbers were also times. So if you wanted to repaint the window, you know, you invalidate the window, you ask for it to be repainted, and then you wait. 30 milliseconds, okay? Oh, why not? Um, if you want to resize the window and relay it out, then that's uh, 50 milliseconds. Um, nobody quite knows why, right? These are sort of, from the dawn of time, um, it's been like that, okay? And so what we found was, uh, when we did this analysis, and this was done with some students in Munich, uh, it was mentoring, and uh, I think various people mentoring, there was a complete zoo of different length timeouts, 250 different timers, with different random numbers in, or some that were same, and nobody knew why. So, <clears throat> now we've sort of fixed it. So we still have timeouts. Some things are periodic. Uh, for example, your cursor blinks. And we can make your cursor blink <laughs> like this, but it's not going to help, right? Um, but other things we really want to get done as soon as possible. So your spell checking, for example. Uh, spell checking happens in the background. You know, we don't want it to get in the way of the application, so we do a little bit of spell checking, and we give it back to the application. We do another you know, dozen, hundred paragraphs, and we hand back and so on. But we still want it spell checked as quickly as we can, so you know, now we're doing this in an idle handler instead of a, I forget what the number was, 50, 100 millisecond uh, timeout. So you know, we can get the work done and get the CPU asleep as well. So from a power perspective, this is also a disaster. What you don't want your CPU to do is constantly wake up, drag all this infrastructure up to these high power states, do a little bit of work, and then go to sleep again. And while the processor is desperately trying to shut everything down and you know, clock gate all these bits of logic, at which point suddenly up again it all comes, and you know, it's, it's just terrible. So this should also save us power and let us get to low power uh, states so the LibreOffice is not consuming your, your laptop. That's the, that's the hope. <coughs> So we have this idle concept, which is you know, stuff that happens when nothing else is going on. Uh, so do stuff later. And of course, we need to prioritize that. So we get rid of all these timeouts, but we say, hey, the resize is the higher priority than the, the paint. So do this one first, then do this one, right? So we, we keep that ordering constraint, and it's now a strong ordering constraint instead of a weak one. Because in the past, <clears throat> the timers that had expired were executed in whatever order they happened to be added in. So you think you have a nice strong ordering, you probably do most of the time, but if something happens that makes them both expire, it's very unclear which one will happen first. So you know you, you get these sort of misordered uh, events that cause glitches. Um, so now when you invalidate a widget, it should get re-rendered as soon as we hit the main loop, and that's very important for double buffer rendering, for GL rendering, um, and so on. There's another feature of Windows that <coughs> I didn't believe possible until I read the documentation. So, so Windows has a very nice uh, call, call, which is at the core of the main loop, which is wait for multiple objects. It's basically a poll system call. You know, wake me up when something happens. And these calls typically have a timer in them. So wait for this long, and if nothing happens, then I'll blink the cursor, right? Or if nothing happens, then I'll do some other, other event. Unfortunately, Windows rounds up the timeout you put in here to 10 milliseconds. So the number is just arbitrarily increased. You can say, I want to sleep for 1 millisecond, and you get 10. So, great. This is not good for performance. 
It turns out there is an, a method call that you can call as an application that alters the behavior of Windows for every other application, right? <laughs> and that makes your timers actually work at high resolution. The problem is that everyone else's timers also work, which could be really bad. You know, like small changes in timing behavior <clears throat> we have seen can have a big impact in, in, in stability. So <clears throat> why does my app only work or not work when some other app is installed? Yeah, well, this, this is bad. So uh, Kendi, uh, thankfully, uh, implemented these high-resolution timers, so Windows spawns a lot of threads. I don't know why it does it, but when you ask for these things, you get about eight threads. And the function of these eight threads is primarily to allow you to sleep for less than 10 milliseconds. So, there you go. Awesome. Anyhow, thanks to the media guys, uh, Jennifer, and Neil, Tobias, uh, Florian Heffman, and so on. Um, there's a whole blurb about there, the work that they did there. Do you do look at the loop? And the code later. There are some problems that come up and that maybe some of you have seen from this. Okay? So previously uh, we would have code that would re-render something every 30 milliseconds, but that's not a huge problem, right? Like it's bad, but it's not terribly bad. Okay? People didn't even notice it. Plenty of time to do other work in between times. Um, we had writer, so, so writer when you typed, um, if you had typed a badly spelt word, but you haven't pressed space yet. I think that's right. Michael Stahl fixed this recently, so uh, you know, perhaps he can tell me. But there's this use case where you end up with a word that we would really like someone to add more to to make it correctly spelt. But we're just going to wait for a bit and hope, hope they, they do something. And unfortunately, the wait for the bit used to be a sleep of you know, 100 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, whatever. So only 10 times a second was it rechecking this pointlessly. Um, but now suddenly we do that really fast, 10,000 times a second, or you know, 1,000 times a second, suddenly your CPU spikes to 100% waiting busily uh, for this keystroke. So there's quite some work, uh, thanks to Michael, to fix that, to uh, wait for a keystroke and then check again rather than you know, being a bit lazy. Um, so, you know, so there are places now where we see these 100% CPU burning hot loops and we just need to fix them. Um, for now, there's a bit of a hack in there that sort of is a bit horrible. So if you have a very low priority idle handler, um, we, uh, we don't let it happen more than five milliseconds, uh, more than every five milliseconds. So we should kill that one master when we fully clean this up. But as a, as a hack, it, it helps. The other thing we often see, or I have seen, and we fixed a number of these, is you, you get LibreOffice and it's working perfectly, but something isn't rendering. So you know there's a window, but nothing is drawn in it. It's black or garbage. And often this is just starvation. So there is some kind of high priority idle handler. It's just banging very hard on the, on, the, on the processor. And no lower priority handler will get in. And a lower priority handler includes the guy that renders the screen. Okay? Well, this is not good. Again, another, another stupid bug. And so, you know, it, it just, just very silly. But luckily, events still come in. So the app is still usable. You know, you can still edit and things. There's just one dialog that doesn't render. Pretty silly. Anyhow, um, so arguably it's better to see these things, to fix them, to fix the power problems, to get rid of the races. Uh, so here's one that Quailon fixed, where it was a configure event is something the operating system t sends you to say a window has been resized or re redealt with in, in Unix. And there was a race between this event, getting this event, and the paint timer. So previously, the paint timer was 30 milliseconds later, right? So we had time most of the time for the operating system to send you the configure event for us to process it and then paint. And so all was well. It didn't crash, right? Unless, of course, you're on a slow machine with heavy load, da 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 da, and insert reason why you might trigger this race. And now, of course, you know, we, we do the paint immediately, and so we have to actually catch these uh, problems that have, have been lurking there for a while. Incidentally, if you have a question or a heckling, do just you know, throw things out. So VCL pointer is the next big, uh, big thing. This is all stuff we did in the last year. So a VCL pointer was my brainwave. It was intended to be a minimal, uh, not a complete fix. You know, the smallest uh, unit of change that we could do. The, the, the basics. So Noel and I rolled boldly, you know, uh, set out to, you know, to avoid getting too stuck to the tar baby. Um, anyway, it's, it's the way you tell them. What's the uh, the thing. So in the end, you know, just when we merged the initial branch before the bug fixing afterwards, you know, 276 commits, 
2,500 files, 24,000 lines plus, 41,000 lines minus, which is pretty good. Um, and make check passed at least two days before we merged. The problem is that rebasing this kind of patch is really extremely problematic. Uh, so actually when we merged it, it didn't pass anymore, but we soon fixed that. Um, and and it's, it's pretty hard to, uh, to keep these things. Uh, we wrote some new unit tests to uh, actually start testing uh, some of these things systematically. And although we have zero open VCL pointer bugs today, you can check the tracker, um, we fixed something like 61 uh, regression bugs on that from different places in the code around the place. And actually, I was really impressed that the QA team are really running master builds. That was just a revelation to me. You know, there were people using weird corners of the app that I didn't know existed, <coughs> you know, uh, which, is, which is great, and uh, finding bugs and saying it crashes. Um, to a degree, we left a very paranoid assertion on that we no longer need to try and find where we'd screwed up some of these, um, these problems. So actually, a debug util build will fail, but the, the product build shouldn't. Um, and of the 61, only five actually escaped to users. So three were fixed in uh, 501, another two in 502. I mean, there will be more, but you know, anyway. So, <clears throat> so what was the change? So previously, um, there was a whole lot of different ways the life cycle uh, could be handled of a, of a window. So a window or a widget, uh, they mean the same thing to me. So you could have a, a widget that was a member. So the whole button lives as part of its parent window. It's a member, it's sort of in line there. When you create the window, you create the button, and when you destroy the window, it just magically goes away. You can have these things allocated on the stack. So you create a message dialog, for example, and that bit would come, and when it, you clicked exit, you just leave the function, it'll be freed. Um, you can have the heap allocated, so you can you know, whack them on the heap. <coughs> and so it's absolutely normal to have some kind of mix of these going on. So it was normal to have a heap allocated parent, and then a whole load of stack or member allocated, not stack, member uh, children uh, inside it, slides wrong there. And so you, know, you delete the parent, and the children would go away too. Unfortunately, this, this can make the life cycle pretty difficult to follow. You know, you have a pointer or a reference to a widget somewhere, and you don't know anything about it, what you can count on, when it will be there, and when it will go away. And it gets worse. So um, a window can have an UNO peer uh, alongside it, which has a strong UNO reference count. So there's a very nice life cycle semantic here uh, for this peer. And depending on how this is handled, this could actually control the life cycle of this. So when you unreference the last one of these, it could delete this guy, or maybe not. It's, so if this is on the, uh, on the stack, obviously you don't want that. So this is kind of an impenetrable mess here, and that's before you start wrapping the pointers in boost. So now you have another you know, means of, of tracking these things. And so depending on who has taken a, you know, just a copy of this pointer, again, the life cycle can get um, pretty, pretty confusing. And so Impress is a particularly good example. You could in Impress because it was trendy and new code, and, and normally a SharePoint is a you know, good sign. Um, there was a mix of you know, life cycle, shared pointers around the place, and just by changing a little bit of ordering, you could completely break Impress in, in really embarrassing ways that no one could predict unless they were an expert in understanding how all the shells interacted and how the framework worked and how the events were propagated. And Impress has some particularly interesting uh, stuff there. So this just made it <clears throat> extremely fragile and hard to see what's going on. Um, partly because of this, this assertion I, I mentioned before, the, the Windows are very paranoid that their children were destroyed before they were, um, because otherwise very bad things would happen. You don't have pointers all around the place. <coughs> um, so yeah. So if you, if you see those, they're, they're, I guess, bad. We should fix them, but they're not. Um, not terribly uh, helpful. And the other problem we saw in the code base is that lots of the code is not really very safe. So, um, so for example, um, in, in this case, so in order to try and work out if a, if a window or a widget has been destroyed, there was this listener pattern. So, you know, the punchline is that the window was created at some point and deleted at some point by someone else. But if you're, um, if you're running code and you're on the stack, and you're about to emit, say, a key press, well, that, that key press could be Alt F4, right? Which is going to close your window and destroy it. But that's emitted on the window you're about to destroy, right? So when you come back from that callback, your this pointer is actually deleted already. 
Okay? So you end up inside a class which has already been deleted by the time you get back into that code. And the problem is that this pattern could happen almost anywhere. Like, you know, the, the, the reentrancy hazards here, are particularly when you start running main loops uh, as children, are <clears throat> a disaster. And, and so, in theory, good code, every time it called out or called something that you didn't know what it would do, should have a pattern where you have a, a listener, uh, we, we, we track this, we add ourselves to this listener, we do something that could delete us, then we check, are we deleted? Is our this pointer invalid? And if so, we do something, we panic, right? We just stop doing things, um, because otherwise bad things will happen. Um, you know, if it's still valid, then we carry on. And, and so you can see this pattern in some places in DCL, the places where it actually crashed, and actually someone came and debugged it, like the keyboard handler, like the mouse event handler. But there are loads of other places that no one ever bothered to fix, right? And so this is really unexpected, it's really unpleasant, it's hard to maintain. And the beautiful thing about VCL pointer is that <clears throat> it gets very trivial to do this. You just hold a reference count on this thing. You know, if you have a VCL pointer parameter that's passed to you, that will be alive. It will be valid memory. Your this pointer will not disappear while you're you know, executing a method. Uh, you know, eventually, of course, it will when the reference count gets to zero. And so this uh, makes a whole lot of code paths safe. Now, of course, <clears throat> we have this dispose pattern and a reference count, and I'll explain that in a minute. But we've made really dozens of code paths uh, much, much safer in this thing. That, uh, you know. So I, I don't know what bugs in the bug tracker we can close that, you know, intermittently when I did this, you know, with this race, uh, you know, something going on. Anyway, so I'm an idiot, as you know. But uh, he, here's Philip Lohman's take on it, who, uh, who maintained VCL for many years. So like, I, I just told him what we'd done. You know. Always seemed like a good idea. Uh, and part of the reason that this wasn't done was that it was a huge API change. And in the old star division, it was hard to know when to do the huge API change, right? Because there was always, of course, commercial pressure. But also, just the building infrastructure made it very hard to do uh, big global changes. So you ended up digging dig deeper and deeper holes that you couldn't get out of. So now, um, all children of all widgets are VCL pointers. Everything is heap allocated. Um, it's a VCL pointer either null or it points to valid memory, and it could point to a disposed object. So let's look at that. One of the problems here is that life cycles, uh, reference cycles are in implicit. VCL has lots of references to itself anyway. Every widget has a VCL pointer to its parents, to its children. So any any widget you look at will have a big reference count, like six or seven, before you've done anything to it. Um, so you know. Lots of references around the place. No weak references, they're all, all pretty strong. So how do we free anything? How can we get that reference count down to zero and actually release anything? Well, so we have a display pattern. Of course, this is familiar to people who've used you know, um, you know, the X component interface has that. Have I run out of time or something? Robert, are you giving us a support? No, no, it, no just not me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So here we are. These, these arrows are sort of ownership pointed. So you know, this, this guy, Owns a pointer to this one, and this one owns a pointer to that one. And so, um, so when we want to destroy this this window and tear it out of the hierarchy and make it visible, do you do colored lights too? I can dance, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so we want to dispose Peter. So we call dispose on it, and what dispose does is it throws away all of the platform peer um, logic that goes to the window. Huh? Oh, that. oh, awesome. Even better. It just likes me. Um, so um, this gets rid of then all of the references that Peter wrote. So instead of Peter having a reference here, it no longer has it. You see the arrow is gone. Uh, instead of it having a reference to something else, it's dropped that as well. So basically tidying up all of its all of its pointers. And you know then we dispose Jane, for example. And Jane had a pointer out, another pointer out at this point, a pointer to herself, with particularly irritating kind of pointers that really screw up uh, a lot of stuff. And they're created during construction, unfortunately. So, anyway. Um, and so she got rid of all her pointers, and now she, no one points to her, and she doesn't point to anyone. So actually, we can then take this away. We're sure it's safe to get rid of this guy. And so Jane would have been deleted at this point. Peter is kept around, because somebody has still, still got a reference to him. But Peter is in a pretty sad place, because he doesn't actually have anything inside himself, really. He's now just an empty shell, you know? He doesn't have any real resources backing him. All of his pointers are mostly null. You know, there's, there's not much there, but there is some valid memory, and you can say, are you alive? Have you been disposed? Uh, you know, and you can call methods on him. You, know, like you can call, give me your title or something, and you'll get an empty string, not a safe fault, right? 
Uh, you can call get me your parent and it will return null. Uh, you know. And so hopefully we've, we've armored the code and made it a lot more defensive uh, in a lot of these cases so that actually um, yeah, this empty placeholder is relatively safe uh, and it trickled through existing code without, uh, without causing problems. Um, we only call the dispose once. We have a little wrapper for dispose once that sets the boolean to uh, make that fly. And uh, yeah, ideally, <coughs> methods calls on disposed object don't set fault. So that's the ideal. Um, it's not there. We've done a lot of the most common ones. So usually we'd fix the bug that causes this to happen and also uh, fix the methods so they don't crash. So the, the dog tag stuff is still there, but we don't need it really anymore. So we'll be cleaning that up. Oh, that's my hope yeah, in the future. Well, we have some problem types that jump out of uh, here. So we move a whole load of the, the window subclasses. So take a button, we move most of the logic from the destructor into a dispose method, right? So we have this, uh, you know, this dispose method, and then the destructor calls dispose once. And we have a client plugin, thanks again to Noel, to check that you're doing this right. So you know, if you're getting warnings saying your destructor doesn't have a dispose once call in it, you know, it, it, your tinderbox will fail and bad things will happen. Um, so there's various checking things around here to make sure that every ECL pointer member you have is either cleared or disposed in your dispose method. So you need a dispose method, you need to clear these guys, and you need to have a destructor that works. So this catches uh, lots of people that do that stuff. Um, th the problem is that there can be other members of Foo that are not window subclasses, and we can't see those and catch those. And we need, previously, these would have been destroyed as part of Foo's destructor. So this method, as well as having the code here, also destroys all of its members first, right? Bang, 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 actually, at, at the end destroys them all, okay? And that, of course, no longer happens uh, in the right place, because we're doing most of what was here now in a dispose method. So that means that in occasion, occasional cases, we need to add new dispose methods to other object types whose ordering is important. Okay, that was a very complicated statement. But you can read the slides later, and I can say I told you so when you can't find the, uh, the button. Okay, so, okay. Um, the other interesting thing is that uh, V tables um, are mangled as you destroy stuff. So, um, here's another complicated example. If you have a base class and a virtual function in it, do foo, the prince, hello world, and you have an inherited class that calls prince, you know, whatever, um, down here, um, this guy, which is the destructor of base, when he calls do foo, he doesn't uh, on, an, on an inherit object. So you have one of these guys, uh, you delete it, this guy is going to call this method, not this method, okay? So as the destruction happens, the vtable is tweaked to make that object look like the kind it is. Okay? And this is kind of obvious to any experienced C++ programmer, etc. But uh, the, the problem is when you move to a dispose pattern, so if you move um, all of this out of here and you put this in a dispose virtual method, it's not true. Suddenly you get whatever out instead of hello world. Okay? And this also creates problems. So um, so there are a number of problem types we've fixed there, a number of ways we've tried to detect that this is happening and <laughs> deliberately not call um, children uh, methods. There's a number of problems there, but again, these I think are mostly fixed by now. Anyhow, some benefits. So we can now implement, I hope we can implement, you know, for interfaces directly inside VCL uh, windows. So in the past, we've often had to have peers that are separate objects, um, and then again, you have another lifecycle problem of tangling these two things together and you know, it's, it's more code and more pain. Uh, and accessibility peers are a great example of this. There are these other objects that are created and lifecycle managed and unhelpful. Um, there's no good way to do that at the moment. I hope it's more stable and reliable. Um, and, you know, <laughs> lots of people can dispose of widget. It doesn't actually matter. You can do it multiple times. So, um, you know, there are, <laughs> there are a number of ways that makes life easier. And we found and fixed quite a few leaks. So whilst walking through this thing, there's a number of dialogues or pop-up things that were just never destroyed uh, that we've caught and found. We've created a few more, of course, whilst doing it. Some monster ones, you know, some, uh, every dialogue is leaked, I think. I think we all fixed that uh, <laughs> the other day. Because, um, yeah, there was, a, there was a thing that wasn't a, a, a BCL, yeah, it, it was holding a BCL pointer and it wasn't checked by Flang. Um, so yeah, and the other thing is that everything's my fault. So previously, Quaylon, you know, touched every dialogue and broke, you know, well, you know, I mean, this, this bugs in anything that you do. And, uh, yeah, but now, we've kind of, I foolishly come along, touched it again, but with Noel, I'm going to hasten to add, 
And, and it's amazing the regressions that my work has caused. In fact, this particular regression was from LibreOffice 4.2, you know, predating the work by a year, and uh, you know, and of course, uh, was the regression apparently. So um, there you go. So that's VCR points that do come and see me if you don't understand it. it I'm sure you have some fun questions at the end. Another thing we did in the last year was created a small test app. Um, so we never had something for VCR that would actually exercise the API in a reliable way and allow us to see how it was behaving. Um, so now there's a test app, and you can click on these various bits, and you know you can test virtual devices, and can you render to them and get the contents back, and so on. And this was really, really very important for the OpenGL work to be able to be sure that we're doing it. Um, there are even unit tests in there. There are benchmarking tests, so you can run these things rapidly in the loop uh, to see what's happening. So. OpenGL rendering. So, two and a bit man years in here, lots of fun. Uh, some code in, in various places in VCL. Um, so, the OpenGL context, which is used outside VCL by, say, 3D transitions in Impress, 3D chart rendering in Calc, um, something else, uh, probably the uh, GL Canvas, I think, uses it. Um, and then there's the VCL backend that implements the, this, you know, effectively the graphics drawing stuff that VCL does. And then there's some Windows uh, Linux specific uh, bits. And why did it take so long to get this to work? Well, you know, I argue that OpenGL is just an appalling programming API. It's really unbelievably bad. It, it has all this global state. Um, so there's the, behind it, there are global variables everywhere. And so you read the code, and unless you're tracking mentally the global state and every call path that comes into this method, you've no idea what it's doing. And this encourages the most appalling code construction because once someone has sort of nailed down the fact that global variables are great as the first design premise, everyone builds on this and creates an even bigger mess. So you would think that it would be possible to do something about this and wrap the state and, and da 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 da. But the problem is that changing the state is unbelievably expensive. So you know, it would be nice to create a, an API on top of it, but if you're talking sort of five, ten milliseconds, to switch contexts or, or you know, to, to radically reorder the state, uh, you, know, it, you might as well give up. So this encourages some horrendous uh, programming and it hides the most horrible bugs, but hopefully we've, uh, we've forgot uh, many of the things. I hope Tarsh here will give us a demo of um, uh, API trace and how we can start to trace what's going on and see uh, how it works. So getting, getting into perform well is fun, but I'm pretty, pretty happy with what we've got and it'll improve. So, and we're heavily using frame buffers to avoid GL context switching. Um, yeah, so, so when you have uh, virtual devices, which we use a heck of a lot, um, yeah, we, we, we try and uh, pull them all into the same GL context. And thanks so much to all these guys who've done, you know, just fantastic work uh, on this, really. I'm a fan of a fraud. I've been here with Julie Marcus, uh, who, you know, spearheaded lots of this, and uh, LFRB, as we call him. Um, so, uh, what else? Yeah. Um, right. Um, so, in terms of understanding um, OpenGL, so OpenGL, um, you know, your GPU runs just this massively parallel um, computer. It's it's very very different to how uh, a CPU works. Um, very very different, and it can do so much so quickly, um, but only of a certain kind. So, for example, um, there's a whole lot of what I call free work. So, you know, the, the, the GPU has a certain fill rate, a memory access a rate. And actually, once it's got the memory, it can then work on it really a lot. And if you don't do much work, you don't get any better performance, right? So, so say you have a particularly funky algorithm, you know, you can, you can perform almost as well as a really very simple algorithm, just because there are bottlenecks or elsewhere in the, in the work, which is interesting. So we can do, you know, all of our alpha blending, well, we'll see some, some other things that we do on the GPU and get it, you know, effectively uh, for free. One of the slight problems we have is uh, lots of texture fraction, so changing little textures. If you imagine a button which has an icon on it, you know, like 16 by 16, and so uh, you know, aggregating those together really makes a lot of sense uh, to have a, a single big texture and then cut little bits out of it. Uh, for rendering to walls and Thomas did a great job uh, you know, handing out patches of pixels to uh, people who want it. Um, various funky, funky algorithms for uh, shaping individual pixels. Of course, the GPU comes from a game world, you know. So if you can imagine, it's it's really optimized for you know working out normals and light, complicated lighting algorithms and whatever. So every pixel in the scene you see at 60 frames a second has very significant floating point maths happening to calculate its color in in a 3D world. 
And so we can we can use that to make sure our pixels are you know uh, are pretty. Um, so so anti-alias lines, for example, is then running quite a you know a funky gradient uh, algorithm uh, across here uh, on each pixel, uh, doing the work again and again. A uh, font rendering. So again, Tor did some great work here. I'm you know, being a fool again. Um, so rendering, um, splitting the rendering. So previously, the initial pass used the operating system to render uh, text into a, a, a GPU buffer and then upload that to the GPU and stick it on the screen. But this doesn't really use the GPU as well as it could be. Texture uploads are potentially slow. They potentially mean a DNA across you know, a PCI Express bus. And so it's much, much better if we can compose and pre-render all these glyphs into a big series of bitmaps and then copy and paste little bits of bitmap across so that you know, the, the rendering of text becomes copying small chunks and alpha blending them on top of each other to make uh, text up. So that's really, really nice. And this creates space for doing the next funky stuff, which Marcus has reserved as his, uh, you know, he has a passion for this, and that's cool, um, to do the GIF rendering on the GPU. So really looking forward to seeing that. Um, and, and using up some of that great spare capacity in, in the GPU's uh, calculation engine to um, render the, uh, the glyphs actually there from the sign distance fields. Are you next? Am I horribly overrunning? I'm just checking. You're next. Oh, okay. Um, how am I doing? Uh, okay, perfect. I have a short one. You have a short one? Oh, thanks. Um, CLC calculation. So it turns out when you load a big impressed slide deck or you load a write document with lots of images, one of the big costs as you load it is actually check something all the images to make sure they're not duplicates of other images, uh, which is a question of all choice at the best of times, but possibly useful. Like if you're loading this, you know, dozen documents with the same images, you don't want to have lots of copies of them around. So um, previously we used CLC32, um, which is really not ideal collision-wise um, for that. Um, we switched to CLC64T, and just as an example of a different CPU GPU, this, the cost of this on the CPU is virtually negligible. Uh, like, it, it doesn't really impact the cost of calculation using 64-bit numbers, because the CPU has all this spare resource lying around, you know, and, and well, 32, 64, or whatever, right? But on the GPU, of course, you know, it actually makes a measurable difference having, having a 64 versus 32-bit uh, calculation. Anyway, so for a very small um, picture, you know, we're getting some kind of like factor of uh, two-ish um, performance win. And um, for a, a, a slightly bigger, but still small in terms of modern cameras image, you know, again, getting, you know, approaching a four, four X. I think as these images get bigger and bigger and you can bring the GPU to bear on this, we'll, uh, we'll get a lot better uh, numbers. Um, and particularly since the previous approach involved pulling the image back from the GPU, having, having transferred it all there, you would bring it all back and then do the CPU algorithm on it, which is, which is not good. Um, and yeah, so we do a double pass successive reduction. We shrink it by 16, and then by 16, and then we do the CPU at the end. And we have unit tests, and Marco's uh, done a nice job there. So, GTK3, I'm not going to say anything about that, because Quaid Orton has a talk on uh, Friday, uh, which should be awesome, but there's a, a big amount of work uh, gone in there. So, my unfunded ideas, my wish lists. Here is the... Uh, the so one of the biggest holes in VCL is that we, we still have a, um, an alpha transparency design that was comes from the 70s or 80s. You know, we have this separate alpha, and this is a disaster because the GPU itself is using almost a uniform RGBA underneath. So you, you allocate the memory anyway, and then you have to have another texture which you're looking up constantly to find the alpha in. And so this is just really stupid. And if it's, if it's less stupid, it's even worse because it's using old code parts in the GL drivers, which you don't want to do. Um, so we could drastically simplify the code, we could improve performance, we could save memory. Uh, you know, it's, kind of, it's kind of a big big thing, however. So from an API perspective, that means removing one of bitmap EX and all bitmap and alpha mask and rationalizing all of that. I'd love someone to volunteer to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, other things we discovered was that uh, Windows were copying the area under the window when it pops up, and then trying to restore it when the, the menu pops down. Um, which is again a good idea in the 80s, probably. Um, but, and also tracking any rendering events that happen to this area and re rendering it off screen in a virtual ah, nasty stuff. So, there's some easy hacks there to pull uh, rubbish out. Um, another thing that VCL has is this idea that it's a reusable toolkit, and it isn't. And it would be nice if we could uh, push some of the stuff down in the upper layers into VCL themselves. So, we'd have less of this something inherits something inherits something. But actually, there's only one guy to pull the way down this inheritance chain. It just adds complexity uh, for no, no real use. Uh, the slideshow, yeah. The, there's a lot of horrible hacks around old VCL problems in the slideshow. They just need to go. So now we have high-resolution timers. 
We don't need our own thread and our own custom main loop and stuff in, inside the slideshow. It would be really good to uh, get rid of that and at least deunize some of that and use a VCL. To write the same for the presenter console as some nasty problems there. We need to finish the idle rework, I guess. There's more we can do there to unify it, make it more clean. Um, and we need to move more things to lower priority idle handlers. I think there's some bugs to shake out there. Uh, LibreOffice Kit Cloud Suite has a very different use model, but we want to save memory by wasting it in great gods. So um, LibreOffice uh, Online will uh, do a lot of pre initialization and then fork so you can load lots of documents in small children. And so it makes a lot of sense to do as much work as you can before you fork because then your children all share that. So for example, rendering every glyph on the system at every size that people think is sensible into bitmaps. Uh, so you can then very rapidly compose them afterwards. And wasting a gig of RAM actually could potentially save you significant CPU time and lots of memory. So slightly different use case, hard to get your head around maybe. Um, the other thing I'm really eager to do is stubbing the font layout stuff so we can actually unit test layout. I think this is just critical. Uh, for the next round of finding badness. So currently cross-platform we can't get something, whether it's a good layout or a bad layout, we can't get a consistent glyph layout. Uh, and we want to, yeah, so there's, a, there's going to hopefully be a tender for that if the board agree, and we'll get some, some really good work there to uh, do that. OpenGL is written with opportunities, so uh, we, the virtual device API loves to create one by one pixel uh, virtual devices, and then throw them away and resize them. So. It's really hard not to do this. So there's just this ridiculous thrash of creating one pixel square textures and then set, setting them up and then throwing them away again subsequently. Are really stupid. Um, so Glyphy, um, yeah, was some great stuff. I'm, I'm hoping Marcus can get there. Uh, keeping geometry on the GPU, so um, we constantly rebuild and retessellate and redo work. We could keep on the GPU cache and then uh, move around, uh, you know, which would be awesome. Um, image and sensitization, your toolbar icons, when, they're, when you can't click on them, they visually change in a way that uh, you can see that. And it would be great to do that in the free cycles we have in the GPU, instead of pulling them to the CPU, banging each pixel and pushing them back again, which again makes no sense. Uh, it would be nice to get the double buffering on, not only because it's good to get it on, but also to stop duplicating that. So if you look at Writer now, the whole core of what goes in a, in a Writer buffer is not only double buffered when Kenny turns it on, but there's a virtual device that it's all rendered into and then it's copied to the screen. And it would be great to unwind some of these older optimizations and get it actually just uh, directly in. And yeah, reduce duplicate work, uh, GL flush less, blah, blah, blah. So the conclusions, so I don't talk too far over and over. Oh, it's gone a long way, I'm sorry. Um, lots and lots of work. Just a huge amount of work has gone into VCL in the, next, in the last year. There will be some problems. Please be patient. Help us, you know, uh, get it right there with us. Big performance wins. Lots of long-term swamp draining. You know, dry land we can stand on, and, and really improving the cross-platform future. And you know, done along with you guys as, as a team. Um, yeah. If you're interested in helping out, grab me. I'll see. Whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>